Welcome to First Mover, your first global look at today's action in the Bitcoin, blockchain, and digital asset space. I'm your host, Christine Lee. Joining me are my co-hosts, Quintus, Managing Editor of Global Capital Markets, Lawrence Lewitton, and Managing Director of International Content, Emily Parker. Good morning, Emily and Lawrence. Good, Good morning. 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 Let's have a look at Bitcoin right now. The Coinbase Bitcoin price XVX index is at $36,857. Bitcoin sliding down almost 4% over the past 24 hours. The Coinbase Ether price ETX index is at $2486. ETH also taking a step back over 5%. And the DFX, Coinbase DeFi index, is at $287. DeFi retreating about 4.5%. Right now, so looking at our top story, we've got some economic data out. U.S. economic growth jumped to an annual 6.9 percent pace in the fourth quarter of 2021, beating out expectations, fueled by monetary stimulus, low rates, consumer spending, businesses stocking back up, and at the same time, personal consumption expenditure (PC) inflation is up about six and a half quarter on quarter. Core inflation up almost five uh, percent in Q from Q3. So. What is that? What the markets are reacting to? I mean, it, what are yeah, your thoughts? I, and, I, and the Fed announcement I, yesterday. Yeah, I, I mean, all of that. So, a couple of things. So, when we look at the GDP growth, it, it's sort of around the rate of inflation in Q4. I mean, like, so net, we're just kind of flat. You know, there wasn't any real growth. It was a lot of it was inflation. Twenty twenty one. I think the the, the total growth rate was five point seven, which is almost as high as. China was back uh, a few years ago when every quarter they'd, uh, they'd pump out 6.97% every quarter. But um, it, it's, no, I, I think the, the crypto markets sort of like sold into the news after uh, Powell uh, talked to everybody and, and, and gave the presser and, and was basically saying, okay, yeah, we're going to raise rates, maybe, mm -hmm. most likely, you know, the, the Fed funds rates a little bit, you know, quarter, uh, 25 basis points, maybe sort of. Mm -hmm. um, so well, it sounds like they're going to make know, a decision I, I, in March yeah. and that they are going to raise rates. Uh, Emily, what, what are you looking and, out yeah. for? Yeah, I mean, there was just a whole lot of build up to the Fed meeting yesterday. But, you know, as Lawrence indicated, there weren't any huge surprises that came out of it. So it was maybe a little mm -hmm. bit less dramatic than some people had expected. Well, people are worried about inflation, including our next guest. And let's check out our spotlight right now. The Coindesk Spotlight is brought to you by Nexo, the place to earn on Bitcoin, Ethereum, and more. All right, the second most popular city in Brazil, Rio de Janeiro, is planning to allocate 1% of the city's treasury reserves to cryptocurrencies. They will also explore applying discounts to tax payments made with Bitcoin. Joining us now is Chico Buyosh, Municipal Secretary for Economic Development in Rio de Janeiro. Hello there, Chico. Thanks for joining us. So Bitcoin is very volatile, but we're seeing high inflation in the dollar and various currencies around the world. So why do you think investing in Bitcoin is a good idea? Uh, hi, guys. First of all, I'm sorry I'm having a little trouble here hearing you, uh, but if you guys are hearing me, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I can read your uh, Rio de Janeiro to allocate 1% of our of our treasury investment here uh, for the first time in cryptos. So I'm sorry I couldn't hear the question, but I can talk a little bit more about this for you. Well, we just established here in the city uh, a working group, and we're now talking a lot to the private sector about what we can do to help this crypto community that is already here in Rio de Janeiro to grow, right? We know this is a decentralized uh, matter. Uh, we know this, uh, the soul of this is just to be decentralized, but we now have companies here in, in Rio, just like Hashtags, for example, that is the biggest crypto fund in Brazil and maybe in Latin America, we have Transfero that created BRZ. It's a Brazilian crypto stable coin that is one-to-one -one parity with the Real. Uh, so it makes a lot, of a lot of sense to the city of Rio de Janeiro uh, to become a tech hub, uh, also working with blockchain technologies. But because of that, we can allocate, we are now studying in this group to allocate part of our treasury, treasury uh, in a crypto. I mean, we know it's volatile. We know we sometimes have uh, some people criticizing us for it, but 
you know, it's the future that is already here. So we want to be a part of it and we want Rio to be a reference to the world just as a crypto friendly city, just as Miami or Zug in Switzerland. We want to be at the forefront. So hi, welcome. Can you can you hear me okay? Can you hear the question? Seems like maybe some uh, audio. I, I'm sorry, I cannot hear you quite well. Um, okay, um, I'll try to ask you. So you, you mentioned a little bit the, the, the issues with volatility that Christine raised earlier. Um, I also heard that in Brazil there have been some you know, crypto-related scams recently, so there's a little bit of public distrust in cryptocurrency. How is the public reacting? Are, 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 like, how do you get over that conception among the public that, you know, Bitcoin is related to volatility, that there are, you know, it's, it's used for scams and also just sort of larger, you know, with El Salvador, you have an IMF warning. I mean, what is the public perception of this project in, in, in Rio? Well, I think people are really excited. Uh, I mean, we had a recent case of a big fraud uh, in the northeast of the state of Rio. So this kind of shook a little bit the credibility of cryptos uh, around the population that is not so used to this matter. So our first goal here is to win this first, uh, uh, let's say, uh, people are not so confident about crypto because of this big case in Brazil. Uh, so we're trying to, to win this, but because we have these serious players in the city uh, that also has some, uh, I mean, market shares in other, other countries and are generating jobs here and are bringing wealth to the city, we were able to, at the first moment, to say, look, guys, we are a tech city. We have big universities here. We have serious people working in these new technologies. We have a lot of smart people uh, putting their money and believing in NFTs and blockchain and all this stuff. And, and suddenly the city was just like really, really excited about this matter. And all the press here in Brazil and Latin America, Latin America wanting to know more and wanting to understand what the city is doing. And also uh, it got people a feeling that Rio de Janeiro was back. We had tough years. Uh, the last four years here were tough for Brazil. I mean, of course, with the pandemic, all of this uh, inflation, for example, is a big issue already in Brazil. And we know that cryptos and some of these coins uh, are deflationary. So maybe they could be used, for example, not to make people lose their power of consumption, of buying things in the market. So this got people really interested about the possibility of having alternative to central banks and to look at new possibilities that we could, I mean, fight inequality that is also an issue in Brazil. So one of the big news, one of the biggest news of, of last year was El Salvador and, 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 and their big push into Bitcoin. And they have one of the headlines that followed from that was, okay, this is going to have a ripple effect throughout Latin America. We're going to see all these other cities and countries doing the same. Was this decision by Rio in any way inspired by what El Salvador did? Well, we were really inspired by Miami, actually. So the mayor just recently had a good uh, call in an event here in Brazil. Uh, in this event, our mayor here, Eduardo Paes, and the mayor of Miami, Francis Suarez, had a really good talk with the public about this thing. Uh, mayor Suarez gave the Brazilians and Cariocas uh, their experience in Miami. And we believe we have uh, some characteristics that Miami also has. I mean, we have the beaches, we, we have a good place to live, we have creativity, we have a people that like to be outdoors working in their computers. So we were more inspired in Miami than in El Salvador, but we think it's a quite interesting experience in El Salvador. I mean, of course, they're acting as a country, so the federal government there has more power to, to make decisions uh, in this matter, uh, more than a city like Rio. But I think our federal government here is already looking for some regulation regarding uh, the crypto the crypto community. We don't know if it's a good regulation yet. I mean, it's just starting, but we know that Rio wants to grow this community here. 
So one thing that Miami has uh, is that it has incredibly favorable tax uh, rates compared to other states in the United States uh, and compared to other major cities. Is there any pushback from residents, from small businesses saying, look, why are you taking my tax dollars to speculate in Bitcoin when you could just cut my taxes and I can grow and we can grow the economy of Rio that way? Why not do it that way? Why not make regulation a lot less? Why not make it easier for crypto companies to form rather than investing in Bitcoin, which might down the road benefit them as opposed to benefiting them right now when they need to start? Well, you know, I think the first thing here is why not do everything at the same time? I mean, why do we have to exclude uh, one uh, problem instead of just bringing everything together and working with the future, right? I mean, we're talking about Web 3.0 here. We're talking about a probably new revolution in the way people pay their bills or pay their taxes or even their investments. It's new for everyone. It's new for us. I mean, in the public, it's new for the private as well. And we're seeing this growth everywhere and we're, we want to be at the forefront. So I think everyone is learning a little bit what the consequences are. So we're not being responsible when we talk about 1%, right? So it's just a small amount to be part of something that could give a lot of benefits, not only for Cariocas, but also for Brazil. I mean, we just launched some programs here to test innovation in the city. That It's a sandbox, right? So uh, we're trying to make innovation a rule here in Rio de Janeiro. I mean, we have mm -hmm. a massive inequality. We have a lot of people living in poverty. Of course, we have wealth as well. But, I mean, if we keep doing all the same things that we have done in the last decade, Will we fix the problems, the complex problems that we face as humans, as a generation? Will we fix, for example, climate change? I mean, how is our economy going to, to talk about uh, incentives for us to fight, for example, climate change without talking about new coins and maybe uh, some carbon credits negotiated, uh, maybe in, uh, I don't know, stable coins or NFTs or tokens. I mean, we have a range new possibility of technologies that give us the tool at least to discuss. I mean, mm -hmm. I think we should discuss, we should debate. I think the society have to, has this uh, necessity to debate, but if you just close our eyes to the new possibilities that we have, I think we'll pay a big price in the future. So we want to be ahead. We want to be in the future. And we believe these new yeah. technologies that well, give Chico. us these tools are a really great way for us to discuss it. Thank you so much for giving us a window into your perspective and these developments in Brazil. I'm really looking forward to seeing how it grows. And thank you for coming on the show. I was uh, Chico Buyosh, Municipal Secretary of economic development in Rio de Janeiro. Coming up, a look into the rollout of China's digital yuan ahead of the Beijing Winter Olympics. Hey, I'm Isaiah Jackson, host of Community Crypto and author of Bitcoin and Black America. You're watching Coindesk TV. Welcome back. China's central bank digital currency, the digital yuan, is set to make its international debut at the Beijing Winter Olympics next week. Athletes and spectators are already testing it out, and about a fifth of the country's population has already downloaded digital yuan wallets. Joining us now to discuss is Michael Sung, founding co-director of the FinTech Research Center at the International School of Finance at Fudan University. Welcome, Professor Sung. So can you set the stage for us of what to expect at the Olympics and this digital yuan? Yeah, so as you know, uh, China has been researching and uh, actively developing their digital run, what we call the ECNY, since 2014. It went into uh, sort of uh, four testbed cities 
uh, last year and has been gr- uh, grown into major, major uh, deployments and, and, and pilots across the country, uh, uh, all over the most economically important parts uh, of, of the uh, mainland. Um, and now we expect that there's going to be an additional sort of uh, pilot that will be happening during the Be- uh, Beijing Olympics, right? Uh, it will be likely to um, include uh, the ability for the foreign athletes to be able to download a digital wallet to be able to uh, transact in the country without uh, bank accounts. That's a new uh, pilot scenario for uh, for Beijing. Uh, most of the um, uh, piloting has been on the mainland, and now we're seeing some light uh, testing in areas like uh, Hong Kong and Macau, cross-border, mostly for uh, Hong Kong citizens to be able to transact on the mainland. So we're seeing an extension, therefore, of uh, the testing uh, to a larger scale. As you mentioned, there's about 260 one million uh, uh, digital wallets have been downloaded. That's double uh, just from a couple months ago. There's been about fourteen billion dollars worth of transactions now, so that's scaling as well. Uh, we will see, but uh, most likely this will be a uh, sort of a, a, a rollout that will t- occur over time. So unlike I think uh, expectations of many in the international uh, media, it won't be an immediate uh, you know commercially scaled uh, uh, deployment at ECNY. Most likely. Uh, continuing test beds will occur. Hi, Michael. It's great to have you here from on the ground, center of the action. Um, so can you just tell us, like, how big a deal is this really, right? I mean, it's getting a ton of headlines, a ton of press. But as we know, China already has one of the most advanced mobile payment systems in the world. Um, there are, you know, Alipay, WeChat Pay. So why is this such a big deal? What is this transformational effect that everybody's talking about? Is it supposed to be transformational domestically or internationally? If you could just put into perspective why the world should care about this development. Yeah, so, uh, well, I think really... Uh, what's happening in China uh, is one of the main catalysts for the the, uh, research and development of uh, central bank digital currencies around the world, right? So I think uh, the initial catalyst was actually the Facebook Libra, which was announced in uh, June of 2019. But because of uh, uh, that happening, uh, uh, Wu Tan who was the uh, who was the Digital Currency uh, Institute director, kind of rushed back to Beijing, and uh, Beijing had decided to uh, uh, you know rapidly uh, increase its timetable to be able to deploy the uh, uh, their ECNY and take a sort of world leading position in that. So by the end of that year, Xi Jinping announced that uh, uh, China was going to commercialize the ECNY. Um, and I think this is uh, really a wake-up call for uh, you know, everyone around the world. A couple of years ago, central banks uh, you know, didn't talk about this. But because of these sort of catalyst moments, uh, I think uh, uh, the writing was on the wall. Um, governments around the world have, uh, have begun to really uh, look into this. Now we have over uh, 90 central banks in various stages of development, um, you know, 16% are actively piloting. We have nine uh, 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 central banks uh, that are, have issued their own digital currencies. So I think this is a, a very, very important uh, uh, transition, right? Because we move, we're moving from the traditional sort of, um, uh, you know, SWIFT-based, um, you know, payment uh, network across the world uh, and leapfrogging into the digital world. And that, that has potential, uh, uh, you know, disruptive impact on the international monetary system, right? Because now in the future, uh, uh, countries will be able to issue their own digital currencies. These digital currencies will be able to transact with each other bilaterally uh, and, and then settle uh, with, without uh, the intervention of uh, the traditional banking uh, monetary system, uh, potentially. And uh, it might even have repercussions on, uh, for example, the, the, the use of the U.S. dollar as a reserve currency. Because if you can bilaterally settle without in- any uh, sort of um, uh, intermediary sort of currency, then, then, then the use of the U.S. dollar uh, might be affected. Thanks, Michael. Actually, I completely agree with you. I think the biggest effect of this has been sort of the ripple effect across the world. We have so many countries now kind of racing to catch up with China. So that brings me right to my next question. There's a very heated debate right now in the United States about if we need a digital dollar or not. And on one side, you have people saying, like, we absolutely have to for the reasons you just said, because it's threatening the U.S. dollar's status as a reserve currency. But then you have other people saying the U.S. cannot go down this road because CBDCs are ultimately not privacy protecting. Um, What is your view does does china cbdc mean that the u.s should 
needs a digital dollar or, or should the U.S. just keep doing its own thing? Yeah, so I think really uh, uh, it, it, China's one to watch because they're one of the uh, first major economies to be able to uh, uh, potentially issue their uh, ECNY. And, um, but, but I think it has a limited impact uh, in, in, in sort of even the medium term, right? Because uh, China stated uh, very clearly that it's going to be a mainland affair only, a domestic affair. And it's only meant to replace M0 money, uh, i.e. cash. So it's, uh, it's, it's uh, influence on the international monetary system is, is limited. Okay. However, as I mentioned to you, uh, the, the cat is out of the bag. Okay, so it's not China. It's the fact that 86% of central banks around the world are all going to do this. And within a sort of a three to five year timeline, we're going to have a digital euro, we're going to have a digital krona, krona we're going to have a digital uh, a naira. Uh, so, so everybody's going to have these digital currencies. And then when they do, they're uh, not going to need to use the traditional international monetary system. Now, the um, uh, uh, my view on what's happening in the U.S. Uh, is that the U.S. needs to take a leadership position in this, right? The Fed actually just issued uh, their long-awaited, uh, long-delayed uh, report. Uh, they've been working, uh, the Boston Fed have been working with the MIT uh, Digital Currency Institute to uh, research this. Um, I have to say, my opinion is that that uh, report was highly underwhelming, right? Uh, in the end, it was inconclusive. Uh, they did not uh, say whether or not uh, they, they were, were supportive of this. Uh, the detail in the report was rather generic. Um, and so I think, uh, you know, uh, the U.S. Is, is going to probably uh, slip behind on the development of the digital dollar vis-a-vis -vis other countries. And uh, this is a classic case of the in innovator's dilemma. Right, where the incumbent power, in this case the U.S., uh, with this existing uh, technology or ecosystem, which is SWIFT and the U.S. dollar, uh, wants to maintain that position, and in so doing, they they really uh, you know fall behind uh, uh, to the just disruptive impacts of the next generation technology. And so I think, uh, you know, my suggestion would be that uh, the U.S. Uh, try to uh, regain leadership in this, right? They're, they're really being left out of uh, what's really happening around the world, right? Uh, in Asia in particular, uh, in Hong Kong, and, 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 and more noticeably in uh, Singapore, they are really uh, leading the world these days on uh, the regulation of digital assets and the deployment of very vibrant uh, digital currency ecosystems. And, uh, and that the U.S. Is not, does not have a seat at the table. So I think... Um, the, the advice would be to uh, really take this seriously, understand that uh, the digitization of value is a phenomenon that will, will, hap uh, will happen without the U.S. involvement, and uh, the U.S. should try to play catch up. What, uh, what role did, you know, you, you were talking about the development, of, for instance, of central bank digital currencies and also stablecoins. So what role did stablecoins have in encouraging China to do this crackdown over the past year on cryptocurrencies that we're seeing and mining and what have you. Um, did, did the government take a more, let's just say, hostile approach to some aspects of, of uh, market cryptocurrencies because of capital control questions or were there other factors involved? I mean, you know, it's so always cited the environmental and, and energy use impact. But was it also a concern that you know, people were buying stable coins in the uh, in, in the over the counter market. I mean, how much how much of that came into play here? Uh, I don't know if the you know stable coins just really quick is 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 very important aspect of the market in 2020 uh, it, it's gone uh, over 20x is now about 150 billion dollar industry growing I would say exponentially. Uh, you know, trillions of dollars of transactional volume. So it, it's 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 a very very important phenomenon that was kickstarted by the DeFi phenomenon. Now, um, I I think stablecoins had less of an issue with uh, what's happening in terms of the regulatory climate in China, uh, rather than just sort of unregulated crypto, right? So because China right now, if you noticed, is is taking a very uh, strong regulatory uh, uh, you know sort of stance. With uh, you know what they consider unregulated industries, right, and uh, and, and uh, unregulated crypto things like ICOs, things like uh, Bitcoin, uh, they view as as being potentially 
uh, disruptive and, uh, and causes instability in the financial ecosystem. And that's what they're worried about the most is the financial instability, uh, you know, uh, of the, uh, the market. So uh, they, they've had multiple sort of, um, you know, I guess, I guess you would call them crackdowns. This latest one where they've uh, basically uh, outlawed Bitcoin mining and they uh, outlawed the ability for Chinese citizens to uh, convert uh, RMB into OTC or to be able to transact, transact in crypto uh, is, is quite major. And I think it will be a sustained thing. And I think what that uh, is setting the stage for is uh, a cleaning up house of the unregulated uh, digital asset market and then leading, uh, uh, paving the road for regulated digital assets, uh, starting first with the ECNY. But I think uh, the other thing that I've been talking about uh, to look out for is China is going to take a world-leading position on regulated digital assets, things like digital securities, right? So already we have, uh, you know, for example, Yao Chen, who was the founder of the DCP, the original uh, a, a project behind the ECNY, has now moved over to the uh, uh, CSRC, which is the uh, S, uh, SEC equivalent of, of China, and uh, are looking at uh, applying blockchain to uh, register uh, digital securitization. So we, we see uh, uh, big moves for China to, in preparation to be able to regulate this across the board. But when they do, uh, uh, they, they will, in fact, uh, be a dominant uh, powerhouse in the development of this entire new world. Wow. You mentioned the crackdown on crypto mining, Bitcoin mining. I wonder, do you think, will it ever come back? And a lot of advocates of cryptocurrencies praise the decentralizing uh, force of it, the self-sovereign power that it can give you, but this seems to turn it on its head and it could potentially create a, a system where we are more surveilled than ever in our transactions and our financial system. And so I wonder if you could speak to that. Is that a clear result that could come out of this? Yeah, I think there's been a lot, especially in the Western uh, media, talking about the surveillance capabilities of, of, of China. Actually, I, I kind of have a, uh, a different angle on this, right? Uh, you know, China's uh, digital payments or mobile payments market uh, has been around for, for quite a while, uh, uh, by being dominated by the duopoly we call uh, WeChat Pay and Alipay, uh, which own 96% of the uh, uh, payments market in, in, in China. Um, and, uh, you know, frankly speaking, China had always had the ability to be able to, uh, you know, uh, go and monitor the transactions uh, within Alipay or WeChat Pay anytime they want. This, this has been a uh, known, uh, known thing. So actually, the ECNY does not really do anything to extend the uh, surveillance capabilities of, of China. It, it has already uh, existed in, in that form. And, and, and also, in fact, um, you know, uh, the PBOC in developing the ECNY has actually uh, spent a lot of, uh, I would say, thought in designing a system that is uh, relatively privacy driven. In fact, um, you know, if you look at the architecture and you actually look into the technical details, the PBOC, as example, doesn't even have the ability to be able to uh, connect the transactions to phone phone numbers and things like this. They have to go through a subpoena to do that. So um, actually, I think the uh, privacy uh, uh, design of the DCP is actually well reasoned. They, they don't have an interest in monitoring every single microtransaction in the country. They want to uh, monitor sort of large payment flows because uh, that is where, you know, uh, money laundering, uh, you know, uh, terrorism financing and, you know, uh, this type of uh, bad, bad behavior occurs. So they, they want to monitor the gateways of what happens. And I would say that that's actually well reasoned. That's not only China, the whole world uh, of every government wants that. And in fact, the existing international monetary system already uh, does some form of that, right? If you have a transaction over $10,000 US dollars going across inter international SWIFT, uh, it's being flagged uh, somewhere and somebody's monitoring it. So I think um, it's it's all about balance, right? You want to be able to have, uh, uh, you know, capabilities to, uh, to monitor compliance and, you know, to prevent nefarious things from happening. At the same time, you want to be able to monitor transactions at a level that would be useful mm -hmm. potentially for fiscal or monetary policy but you don't want to encroach on the individual uh, privacy of individual citizens. Mm -hmm. And I think they've had struck that balance reasonably well.
Well, Professor, thank you so much for this very fascinating, very clear explanation of what's going on in China, it's certainly at the leadership of CBDCs so far. That was Professor Michael Sung. Thank you for joining us at Fudan University. Coming up, checking in on crypto with the markets update with Michael Venuto from Torozo Investments and a regulatory news update with Coindesk Global Policy and Regulation Managing Editor Nick Day. The Markets Update is brought to you by KuCoin, the best place to find the next crypto gem. Here's a live look at Bitcoin. The coin Bitcoin price XVX index is currently at $37,016. Bitcoin giving back some gains about 3.3%. The coin Ether price ETX index is at 2,504. ETH also trailing by about 5.4% over the past 24 hours. And the new DFX coin DeFi index is at 287, retreating about 4.5%. Joining us now to discuss the crypto markets is Michael Venuto, Chief Investment Officer at ETF Asset Management Firm, Toroso Investments. Hello there, Michael. So the other day we had Fed Chair Jerome Powell saying that the Fed will likely raise rates in March. They'll make a final decision. Uh, and we see that the crypto markets are falling. Is that linked to a statement? I'm sure it has some impact, right? Uh, everybody loves to throw around the term that Bitcoin is a hedge against inflation. And if the Fed is going to start to actually try and deal with inflation, people are going to run a little bit. Um, I think most of the price movements, though, have been more related to unraveling some leverage and tax law selling and all of that. I don't think that the Fed really has the power to raise rates at the level they need to to actually combat inflation. I think it's a, a political issue that will raise its head very quickly. I, nonetheless, I mean, the Fed has the ability to sell, uh, you know, it has $8 trillion on its balance sheet now. So if it really push come to shove, they could just start dumping a lot of what's on there and boost rates that way, right? I mean, like you could ultimately sop up a lot of that, that extra liquidity that's going on in the market if it has all this, if it has all this on its balance sheet, if it's been buying it up because of, because of the pandemic. Yeah, look, the Fed is in a really tough position. Right, they they have to combat the inflation in some way, but they also don't want the markets to collapse. Um, and crypto, Bitcoin, the prices are kind of foreshadowing what it's going to do to equities. We've seen a little bit of it in equities, but not to the level we've seen in crypto. Now, all that said, this is a short-term correlation. Like over time, crypto is going to trade based on the transformational change it's doing to the world and all the applications that are coming. I mean, that's really where I'm most excited about coming into 2022. I'm seeing the private companies that are really changing the world using blockchain move into the public space. And in block, we're finding some amazing things out there. So, Michael, as you know, with Bitcoin, it's usually like a price looking for a narrative. And then the dominant narrative has been the Fed, inflation, and that's what's driving the market. Are, are there any other factors that p might exist that people are not paying attention to? For example, there's a lot happening with Russia right now, right? We have Russia threatening a crypto ban. We have, you know, threatened uh, invasion of Ukraine. Like, is, is that playing into the larger market at all, in your opinion? Yeah. So, like I said, the foreshadowing. Crypto trades 24-7. Right. And and so it reacts to these call it geopolitical events faster than the equity markets do. And there's less derivative exposure, less ways that people hedge. So, you know, it, it's a harbinger of the reaction people have to any risk assets. And then there's a lot of narratives out there. We we see the narrative of store value, the narrative of uh, a hedge against inflation, and they all get tested in a hyper uh you know, loop, if you will, because it's all available all the time, right? The, one of the big narratives last year was institutional investment, right? Michael Saylor and MicroStrategies, they really started that off. And then everybody said, where'd it go? Well, the interesting thing is because there was still some uncertainty from the regulators, uh, a lot of it actually went into the picks and axes, right? 
30 billion went into private equity or investments into companies doing stuff in the blockchain. And I think I've said this quote before too, but you know, I'm part of the ETF industry, right? That that's really my my core business. Um, we we run the ETF of blockchain stocks, but the ETF industry last year generated about 12 billion in revenue. Bitcoin and Ethereum miners generated over 21 billion. So my 26 year old industry is generating less than just the miners. And then you add in all the applications, all the things being built here. I mean, I'm doing my deep dive in NFTs right now. I, I think it's amazing what's changing and what is going to be available and how mortgage origination is going to change or already has changed at many community banks where they're ahead of the big money center banks now. So I'm, I'm extremely excited. I just don't think it happened the way everybody thought it was. They thought $30 billion was going to go into Bitcoin. It went into the picks and axis. Um, and I think so, that was just a lack of regulatory clarity. So where where are the deals right now? What are you what are you throwing money at? And uh, you know how can we jump in on this? Is uh, I guess. <laughs> wow, Lawrence, you gave me a nice one here. Um, look, in yeah. block this year, uh, we we still have a good bit in the miners, especially what I would call the higher quality ones, the ones that know how to work with traditional finance so that they have the money to survive any of these downturns or these um, small winters that we've seen. Real excited about Core Scientific. They're literally the largest miner, and they just came public through a SPAC. Um, great management team. They were really a hosting company that helped other people mine, and now they're getting into the mining themselves. Beyond the miners, super excited about again the trans the um, the applications. What some of these community banks like uh, Customers Bank and Signature Bank and Silvergate are doing, not only to take traditional finance and link it to decentralized finance, but also to use the applications, things like what Mike Hagney's doing at Figure to essentially make it so, you know, a refi or a mortgage can be done in five hours instead of five weeks. That puts them ahead of, of Wells Fargo. <laughs> like that's, that's doesn't happen. Yeah. You still had you still have stronghold. I, I remember you were you were uh, yeah. saying that that you 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 were a big fan of what they were doing and and companies like that. I, I, have, has that changed at all? We've actually added to stronghold. Uh, Dan Weisskopf, who's my co PM on Block, went to visit the facility last week um, and see how the power generation is working. We think very highly of what they're doing, but it is still early stages. They're bringing. If they've got the energy capacity online, they have to bring more and more of the actual Bitcoin mining online. And they're doing it in a very efficient manner. Great management. Um, we're really excited about what, what they're doing. <laughs> what, what, what do you think is hurting in stock, though? Because uh, it, it's had a, it's had a tough uh, yeah, month. Yeah, data from the market price, uh, the way that the SPAC unravels. All these things that have come public when um, the markets are down, when Bitcoin's gone from 69 to, to 37, they, they suffer. Right? Um, Michael, very quickly, just 20 seconds, price analysis on Bitcoin. Is it short term? Where do you see the price going? I think we got three months of, of headaches. And then I think we continue our path back to over 100 grand, probably closer to 200 over the next 18 months. You're awesome. Michael, thanks so much for joining us. That's Michael Venuto, CIO at Terrazzo Investments. Time to check in with Coinbase Global Policy and Regulation Managing Editor Nick Day. And I can't wait to get into this one because oh Wonderland Dow is all over the internet on crypto Twitter uh, and the talk forums. And, and this, this is a crazy, well, this is an interesting development. So people have figured out that Wonderland Dow, the treasurer, uh, is the co-founder of Quadriga CX, Michael Petrin. And if you are unfamiliar, that is the Canadian exchange that collapsed in 2019 after the founder, Gerald Cotton, disappeared with $169 million. And this is from a Twitter user, ZachXPT.eth. Nick, what's going on here? Yeah, I, I mean, I woke up and I was like, wow, I can't believe this guy's name is in the news again. I mean, here's the thing. So, <laughs> It sounds like uh, the one of the other founders of Wonderland knew who Michael Patron was and uh, said, you know, he didn't want to let a mistake uh, define his career going forward. But Michael Patron has 
been, you know, he was a co-founder of Quadriga CX. He was not really affiliated with the exchange at the time of the collapse, but before that, he was, you know, convicted or seems to have been convicted of uh, being part of a scheme to sell credit cards and deported from the U.S. He served time in jail for that as well. Uh, he's been allegedly part of high yield investment programs. So you know, it's not really a mistake when someone who has uh, been tied to various scams over the years, going back as far as 2003, uh, so 19 years ago, is suddenly you know part of uh, a new project. It's you know raises questions of trust, but um, yeah, it's just such a bizarre thing to find out. So shocked that Wonderland had this. Um, so speaking of high yield, the, the SEC is uh, questioning the likes of uh, Gemini and uh, Voyager. Correct? I mean, they're they're they've been uh, sending out letters. Yeah, so um, it seems the SEC is questioning crypto lenders about you know what exactly it is they're doing. Important to note that at not you know at this point at least no wrongdoing has been alleged. It seems to be the SEC is just asking questions and trying to learn more about this. But it, you know it's kind of to be expected, especially given that state securities regulators have already ordered you know a couple crypto lenders, uh, BlockFi for example, to uh, either cease and desist or explain what they're doing because there is a concern that they might be violating state securities laws. So this does seem to be kind of just an escalation of regulatory attention being paid to this particular issue um, remains to be seen what that will actually lead to. Mm -hmm. Nick, just returning to the Wonderland DAO story. So we also have the statement from one of the founders, Danielle Sestagali, saying, I'm of the opinion of giving second chances. As I have mentioned on Twitter, I have decided that he needs to step down till a vote for his confirmation is in place. Nevertheless, uh, Wonderland has a say to who manages its treasury, not me, and the rest of the Wonderland DAO. But, but other folks on Twitter have revealed that, yes, he's known about this for about a month. Uh, nevertheless, he was more concerned about his reputation and how would that look. And so kind of withheld this information until now that it has been leaked. And, you know, I... Uh, I, was this a, a sort of willful ignorance or, you know, it, it just doesn't look good for the crypto community when you see this time and time and again? Yeah, I, I mean, like I said, you know, uh, Patron's been credibly accused of being involved in various scams dating back almost two decades. And the fact that, you know, the founder here, uh, Danielle, seems to have known about these allegations for a month and said nothing um, you know, I admittedly, you know, I, I was catching up before coming on the show this morning, so maybe I missed it. But as far as I can tell, it doesn't seem like Danielle told anyone. Doesn't seem like he, uh, you know, uh, even hinted that he might be concerned about this at any point until this was revealed last night. Mm -hmm. So that does raise questions about, you know, what else is he aware of that he's not sharing, or you know, is he just? I don't want to use the word gullible, but you know, is he just kind of trusting that this person? Uh, isn't going to either, you know, harm his project or him and his project, mm -hmm. or is he just, you know, hoping for the best? You, it, it's a question. You're, it's a you're, being, you're being kind. You're, the question is whether he's a liar or a fool. I think that's the, uh, that's what you're, but you're, you're, you're more diplomatic than I am. That's for sure. <laughs> All right. Well, the yeah, community. I think that's a fair question. The community at Wonderland is putting the, well, the is dumping the coin. It's down about ninety three percent over the past three months. Uh, about fifteen percent oh. over the past twenty four hours. All right, yep. Nick, we'll wrap it there. They Thank have you a so home much. To go to. Yeah, that was CoinDesk Managing <laughs> Editor of Global Housing Regulation, Nick Day. Don't forget to sign up for the State of Crypto newsletter on CoinDesk.com. And let's take a look at some of our tweet of the day. Is this one, you know, from Zappy Boy? Just taking a look at crypto Twitter, sir. Can you explain how Sifu's wallet value jumped from 45 million USD to 445 million USD in the last month? I really can't figure out what's going on. Honest question. Sifu, being Michael Patron, formerly co-founder of uh, Quadriga. Uh, CX in Canada. That's also some another yeah. Nice rug pulling. <laughs> so now, now yeah, I, I exactly. need to do the carpets here. So I need somebody to pull these rugs. Just saying. <laughs> Anyone want to come tweet, in? Another tweet from Joe Weisenthal, who's a podcaster, saying, you know, sorry, but there needs to be 
more soul searching in crypto DeFi. What does it say when you can't trust who's managing the treasury of a Ponzi coin? So I think uh, <laughs> this is a developing story. We'll hear more about this later on. That's it for First River. Thank you, Emily Parker and Lawrence Lewiton. I'm your host, Christine Lee. Check us out at noon for The Hash. All our friendly folks there, Zach, we got Naomi, and all about Bitcoin at three o'clock. You're watching Coindesk TV. Next up, stay tuned for the daily forecast to see what's happening in the Asia crypto markets. Welcome to the Daily Forecast, January 27th, 2022. I'm Angie Lau, Editor-in-Chief of Forecast News, covering all things blockchain. Well, NFT trading volumes have gone through the roof already this year, while cryptocurrencies continue to struggle. We're going to take a look at the divergence between the two markets and a whole lot more coming up. Let's get you up to speed from Asia to the world. Well, let's kick off with some of the top stories coming out of Asia today. First up. Russia's finance ministry has opposed calls now from the country's central bank to ban cryptocurrency outright. Now, just last week, the Bank of Russia issued a report which recommended a comprehensive ban on crypto-related activities, describing crypto as a pyramid scheme. While the ministry's director of financial policy responded by saying, hold on a second, a ban on crypto transactions and mining could hamper the country's growth in the industry. Now, President Putin has since waded in, saying the two need to come to some kind of unanimous opinion on the matter. Now, Russia joins a growing number of countries debating the issue, with India just one example, where local media reports that another delay to its crypto bill is likely. Meanwhile, over in South Korea, media regulation agency is stepping up efforts to prevent sexual harassment in the metaverse. A council launched by the Korea Communications Commission will discuss violence, sexual crimes targeting minors, and other pressing issues on the metaverse. The move comes after cases were reported of children and teenagers being lured into sending photos and videos of themselves with the images being used to create sexually exploitative content. Now, the current law prohibits adults from inducing sexually exploitative conversations with minors. However, violations are occurring in the metaverse. Meanwhile, lawmaker Kang Sung Woo has spearheaded amendments to the law with a draft bill proposing that platform operators should be held more accountable and mandating immediate reporting of any violations to investigative agencies. You can find those stories and more at forecast.news. Over in the markets, NFT sales have had an explosive start to the year, while crypto remains a sea of red. Now, are we starting to see a split developing between the two? Forecast News' Lachlan Keller reports. Leading NFT marketplaces Looks Rare and OpenSea have seen record sales this month, with 12 billion US dollars worth of transactions between them so far this year, while the total crypto market cap has plunged almost 30% at the same time. One expert told Forecast News that while investors are taking risk off the table in the crypto side, there hasn't been a corresponding pullback in NFT trading volumes as a result of buyer profiles changing. People who are buying NFTs are uh, interested in culture and art. Uh, people who are buying crypto are interested in solely an investment or a risky asset. Um, so we're seeing buyers diverge. Kalpu says more unique buyers are getting into the market and crypto, or Ethereum in particular, being down is acting as an incentive. Lower real prices are affecting it by giving it more demand. So people um, find it more affordable to get into these collections if the real dollar value is less. Jonathan Miller of Kraken agrees that the two are very different marketplaces nowadays, with an evolution underway. NFTs are detaching from the rest of the kind of crypto space when it comes to pure you know, financial services type infrastructure. NFTs are ha have their own, um, you know, their own drivers. And we're seeing that play out in, in the, the early months of 2022. Miller also says that the NFT market works very differently to crypto because people make bids and offers for sales that they don't expect to be accepted immediately using smart contracts that are costly to modify, while crypto moves in a more fluid and dynamic way. For Forecast News, I'm Lachlan Keller. Digital currencies have had a grim run of late. We've seen Bitcoin and Ethereum lose almost half their value from all-time highs, while Solana has dropped over 60% from its peak. 
leading, of course, to plenty of questions about the stability of cryptocurrencies. This as the Russian central bank has proposed a complete ban on crypto mining and trading. So how are all of these developments shaping the new economy? Michael Wu, CEO and founder of Amber Group, a leading digital assets platform, joins us once again to answer all the questions. Good to see you, Michael. Good to see you, Angie. Well, Michael, many analysts are closely tracking ETH to Bitcoin ratio, which has started to fall and is being viewed as a sign of vulnerability of ETH to swings in risk appetite. What are your thoughts? I think the key word here is indeed risk appetite. I mean, uh, even among uh, the crypto uh, asset class, Ethereum is on the higher risk uh, spectrum than Bitcoin because, of course, you know, it's, it's shorter history, um, it's more dependency on its uh, utility and, and uh, the growth of the ecosystem versus Bitcoin is consensually already seen as digital gold or storage of value. There's very little uh, challenge to that. Now we are sort of in a, a sell-off and uh, a risk appetite has been pulling back on concerns of central banks' monetary policies, on inflation, on Fed's uh, potentially hiking four times this year. We discussed all of this in previous sessions. And because of that, uh, I think, you know, uh, uh, portfolio managers, traders, asset allocators tend to uh, flow back to the safer end of the assets, which will benefit Bitcoin uh, uh, among all the cryptocurrencies. Well, to rub salt into the wounds, let's talk about geopolitical risks here. We are seeing on the ground escalation between Russia and the Ukraine. What risks does that pose for crypto markets, you think? Uh, first of all, I just want to say it's um, very uh, sad that, you know, whenever, you know, this kind of geopolitical, um, 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 you know, risks happen. Now, secondly, in terms of its effect on crypto, right, of course, you know, um, the volatility itself, right, will shock all asset classes. And uh, in this case, you know, uh, I think uh, equity markets have been reacting to that. Uh, and uh, as well as crypto um, as, you know, an, as an investment class or, or as almost like a risk asset in that case. On the other hand, long term, uh, you know, I actually think these kind of geopolitical uncertainty uh, without, you know, uh, uh, specifically talking about this case even, um, you know, I do think uh, further strengthens the narrative that, you know, we probably need a more decentralized economy or at least, you know, a economy that's less dependent on global geopolitical powers. Right. I mean, Russia is a fairly important player in the crypto world with about 10 percent of all global mining taking place in the country. How worried are you about their central bank's proposal to halt all crypto related activities? In, in the short term, of course, I'm following closely to it as, you know, I think active investors or traders should be regarding these significant geopolitical events. But over time, we have seen, you know, Bitcoin or the crypto economy is very resilient to any single uh, uh, geopolitical shock or any single region's uh, regulatory policy, right? Uh, as you mentioned, Russia now accounts for maybe over 10% of the global uh, mining um, uh, hash rate, but uh, China, before its uh, you know uh, its restrictions on crypto mining, uh, used to account for over 50% of Bitcoin's global hash rate, and Bitcoin is just doing as fine after you know the the, the restrictions came out. So I I'm not too worried on that. Uh, frankly speaking, I think, you know, uh, being the decentralized network it is, Bitcoin will find uh, its way to thrive. Absolutely. It is, after all, the new economy and these rules are ever changing, as are the standards that are shifting as well. Michael, thank you so much, as usual. And that's the daily forecast from our vantage point right here in Asia. For more, visit forecast.news. I'm Editor-in-Chief Angie Lau. Until the next time.